Undrafted free agents, rookie minicamp, and OTAs on the horizon. It means that the rookies' time to shine has come here at the Star in Frisco. But don't worry, the vets are coming in next week. We talk about it all right here on The Blitz. Pops out to the right, breaks a tackle. They blitz it. Prescott throws it down the right side for Lamb. Caught it! The throw, rush, sack by Parsons. Heaves it deep down the left side for Gallup. He's got it. Touchdown. Just under seven weeks until training camp in Oxnard, California, which means football is in the air again here at the Star in Frisco. Welcome into the Blitz, the Dallas Cowboys report. Alongside Britt Johnson, I'm Kyle Yeomans as we take you through the Cowboys offseason. And hey, workouts on the field outside. The rookies are in the building. The vets coming in next week. It just starts to smell like football I, again. Yes, I, I was smelling. I was breathing it all in this, this past weekend when we did rookie minicamp, and it was great. Had okay. it outside. It was hot. It was in the mid 90s all the way through. The rookies certainly had their first test of the Texas Perfect heat. Perfect football weather. That's exactly you know. what it should be. That's <laughs> what Mike McCarthy called it, anyways, and plenty of learning going on throughout these walls. But let's talk about those that will remain inside these walls. Eight of the nine rookie draft picks have signed their rookie deals. Only one guy left. That's Jake Ferguson, the tight end out of Wisconsin. But you have all but one wrapped up. Jalen Tolbert, Sam Williams, each signing their deals this week. And the rest of the rookie draft class is taken care of. It's good to have that nice and out of the way. Absolutely. Uh, I am really excited about Jake Ferguson in particular. I know he's the one guy that has not been signed yet with the Dallas Cowboys, but I'm a Big Ten girl. I'm an Ohio State fan, so I've seen him play a lot at Wisconsin while he was in college, and he was great to see on the field during rookie minicamp. Yeah, he was one of the, or he is the only one to not sign, but he was one of those value picks in the middle of the round. How do you feel like he looked at, you went out to practices during the rookie minicamp, how do you feel like he looked out there? I think he looked great. I will say this. Uh, he needs to eat some of those Texas cows and get a, get a little <laughs> bit of weight on him because I know we already signed Dalton Schultz, and so we are looking for a tight end that's going to be more of a blocking tight end, and I do think he needs to gain a little bit more weight if he's going to be utilized as a blocking tight end for the Dallas Cowboys team. Yeah, I don't know if it's the number 48 that it, at least throughout the number, organizational <laughs> uh, history has been a slimming number used for fullbacks and so on and so forth, but I agree with you. Somebody that does not need to slim down at all is Matt Willetsky. Go. Six foot eight, mm. 320 plus pounds. He was a monster of a man. He went up against Sam Williams on a couple of occasions. He was able to show some of his strength up against first round pick Tyler Smith. Anybody else stick out to you from the offensive side of rookie minicamp? Obviously, we know Jalen is going to be a guy that's in there. We're going to talk about him more later on in the show, but I, I was surprised by him. I liked him a lot, and I'm excited to see what he does, especially considering he's going to be one of those players that is potentially going to be a plug-and-play player for the Cowboys to start the season off. And, of course, Dan Quinn utilizing young talent last year on the defensive side of the football. Micah Parsons as a rookie, defensive rookie of the year. Do you see anybody else shining like Micah Parsons did this time last year? Okay, last year the Dallas Cowboys, their energy and effort was their their identity last year. And I kind of looked at the guys, what, what their energy looked like, not what they were doing on the field, just because it is rookie minicamp, so we're not going to get to see a ton of stuff. They're not in pads, they're not really hitting. But this guy right here, Damone Clark, he was amazing. He did not practice. He's coming back from a herniated disc, so he did not practice. But his energy out there, he was cheering everybody on. He was walking through everything, and I just loved that energy, and I thought it fit right in with what the Dallas Cowboys did this last season. You look at Damone Clark, a fifth-round pick out of LSU. There's a possibility he does not play in his entire rookie season. However, you mentioned it, the, the mental reps, the learning ability that he showed and in, in his willingness to soak it all in and drink from a fire hose is certainly something right. that he has been doing from an in informational standpoint. He was raved about by the, this coaching staff throughout the rookie minicamp, media availability, and somebody that I think everybody has their eyes on to maybe look forward. It's tough to really evaluate defensive talent exactly. in rookie minicamp, but that is intangible, and that's something that you could definitely look at moving forward. Speaking of some of these rookies, Let's talk a look, take a look at some of the undrafted free agent Marquise Bell. Can he make an impact in that defensive secondary? 
The Blitz is brought to you by AT&T, official sponsor of the Dallas Cowboys, and by the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. This segment is brought to you by AT&T, official sponsor of the Dallas Cowboys. Over the last two summers, two former Dallas Cowboys undrafted free agents were inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Drew Pearson and Cliff Harris, each not drafted, each now in Canton. As we welcome in David Hellman, DallasCowboys.com draft expert. We're not talking about who's going to Canton, so don't worry about I'm that. I'm about to say, like, whoa, we are starting <laughs> with some high expectations here. We are talking about 20 names that the Cowboys have added this offseason that would like that to happen throughout their career. 20 undrafted free agents. We're going to hit some of the high marks of this undrafted free agent class and some of the rookies that will look to make an impact. Let's start on the offensive line. A couple center prospects, starting with Alec Lindstrom out of Boston College. A couple guys here that can maybe make an impact in terms of depth. Whenever I look at undrafted free agents, it's either follow the money or what position needs competition. And for two years at this point, center has been that spot. Yes, Matt Farniak has some center experience. He's been working at it this offseason. But for two years, Tyler Biotish has really been the only option here since Joe Looney left. And so I, I look at Lindstrom, a guy that a lot of people uh, thought of as a day three draft pick. I mean, you saw people with grades as high as the fourth round on this guy, two time all ACC. I was honestly shocked to see him fall out of the draft. So it makes sense for him to come here and, you know, maybe not grab the starting job as a rookie, but again, there's not a lot of competition. If he's good enough, he could easily get the backup. And the same thing goes for James Impey, the BYU guy. 41 career starts. I mean, he's been doing this for a long time. You hear people rave about his IQ, like the, the mental aspect of the center position, being able to ID uh, defenses and help with shifts and things like that. I think that gives him a real advantage. Yeah, you mentioned the 40 starts for MP. If there is competition, it may be out of this undrafted free agent class with Lindstrom and MP battling it out to be who could become the backup center under Tyler Biotish. The one thing that goes against James MP, he's got that wrong side of the over under. He has over 25 years of age and under 300 pounds. So two things that don't necessarily go his favor. Lindstrom is a little bit younger. He's a little bit bigger. Both of those guys could certainly play a role into it's, the depth of that offense. It's funny though line. because like yes that's that's going to keep you from getting drafted that's maybe why the Cowboys didn't love Tyler Linderbaum the Iowa center a little north south of 300 but once you're here you just play and and if you're the best guy for the job man then, you know, all bets are off so I'm looking forward to seeing those guys. Absolutely love hearing that. Now, what about Marquise Bell? FCS All-American. He was a 30 visit. And out of Florida A&M, 4-4-1, 40-yard dash at the safety level. He's a little bigger than I anticipated when we saw him at a rookie minicamp. Look, I'm not knocking Marquise Bell's ability as a player. He's long, dude. Like, you talk about Dan Quinn loving these long DBs. He fits in that mold. But again, follow the money. If you followed on social media, Marquise Bell was given a pretty penny to choose the Cowboys. And that is typically an indicator that they see something in this guy. Again, maybe he doesn't make the final roster, but this is a guy they could keep on the practice squad. When you're talking about like a $200,000 salary and a hefty signing bonus, this is a guy that they've ID'd as somebody they want to try to develop. I think that's more than anything. Again, I think he's a good player, but I like his odds because of that too. And last but certainly not least in terms of highlighted undrafted free agents, how about Jonathan Garibay? Kicker from Texas Tech. We don't have any highlights because he is a kicker. He did make a 62 yarder to win against Iowa State earlier in his career, but he, talk about some efficiency. There's his numbers throughout his collegiate career. Oh, and by the way, he was automatic from inside 50 yards during his final season in Lubbock. I think Cowboy fans are probably looking at that mark on extra points and think, saying, oh, please just let extra points not be a roller coaster for a change. <laughs> it's funny because I mean, kicker's a little bit different, but this is an undrafted free agent who has the capability to win the starting kicker job. There's going to be some competition, but I would call Jonathan Garibay the favorite to be the kicker right now. I mean, again, things can change once you get to training camp. You don't know who all will be available, but if he puts his best foot forward, pardon the pun, 
Uh, <laughs> he's got a chance to be their starting kicker. And again, if you want to see highlights, yeah, go look up the 62 yarder against Iowa State. It'll give you a little bit of an idea. Plenty of highlights from that undrafted free agent class. We didn't even mention the bevy of wide receivers that they brought in. Maybe we'll save that for a later episode. But speaking of wide receiver, how about Jalen Tolbert? Could he replace some of the lost production in the wide receiver room this offseason? This segment was brought to you by AT&T, official sponsor of the Dallas Cowboys. With the 88th pick in the third round of the 2022 NFL Draft, the Dallas Cowboys selected Jalen Tolbert out of South Alabama. The wide receiver may be going up against number 88 in terms of production early in the season without Michael Gallup in the fold. But what exactly will his role be as a rookie in the NFL? Britt Johnson has more. Thanks so much, Kyle. The key for football players after the NFL draft is often a positive outlook. Oh, and according to the Cowboys third round pick wide receiver Jalen Tolbert, making sure the coaches don't regret drafting you. Uh, definitely, you know, showing coach that, you know, I'm not a, mis a, a draft mistake, being able to go out there and do everything and more, you know, that they believe in me that I can do. And so I'm excited to do that and then uh, start building team chemistry with, with my teammates and, you know, going out there and all working for the same goal. So I'm just excited for the opportunity ahead. Jalen was named the Sun Belt Conference's Offensive Player of the Year in 2021 and currently holds a school record at South Alabama for recording 82 receptions for 1,474 receiving yards and eight touchdowns. So it seems he handles pressure well, and it doesn't hurt he has a friend in high places. Uh, I mean, now it's the work time. So, uh, I mean, I talked to Dak right after I got drafted. Um, he ended up shipping me a playbook. So I've been on, you know, on the plays, and I would actually talk to him in the locker room before all this started. And we were talking about plays that I, you know, knew and what I was still looking at in the playbook. And, you know, excited to get to work. And, I mean, I've just been working out and, uh, you know, getting ready for this moment. With Michael Gallup potentially missing the start of the season due to his injury, Jalen Tolbert could see some targets early on this season, and it looks like he is more than prepared. Kyle, Dave, could Jalen be the offense's missing piece? Well, that's the thing is, is what is his role going to be overall? That's the biggest question around Jalen Tolbert. And, hey, he may have to come out early on and provide some production without Michael Gallup in the fold. Of course, no Amari Cooper, no Cedric Wilson, no Malik Turner. His wide receiver room looks a little thin. How can he help combat that? I don't think there's a may about it. He, he has to, <laughs> especially for these first few weeks. I would go as far as to say, I don't know if they're going to have Michael Gallup for at least the first one, two, maybe three, four weeks of the season. This is a guy who needs to hit the ground running. Fortunately for the Cowboys, they've done this before. This was Michael Gallup in 2018. Third round pick, came in and started. And I think what made Jalen Tolbert appealing to the Cowboys is the versatility. Like, he's a ready-made player. He doesn't – I mean, he played X for South Alabama, but he can do a variety of things. We're going to get to it in a minute, but he can play inside. He can play outside. I think when you have a guy that's versatile like C.D. Lamb, that's important. You're not dealing with a guy that's just stuck in one role. He's got to do this. He's got to be our slot. He's got to be our X. No, Jalen Tolbert can do a little bit of everything. And he was in the conversation to be selected in the second round because of that versatility. And Jerry Jones even talked about this game specifically against the University of Tennessee because, of course, from South Alabama, played in the Sun Belt, not the best – conference competition level wise, but he certainly showed out against the balls. So it, it kind of surprised us, right? Like the Cowboys drafted more small school players in this draft than we're accustomed to seeing. But Jalen Tolbert balled at the senior bowl against the best of the best. And oh, by the way, when he got a chance to go against an SEC team like Tennessee did pretty well. He caught seven passes for 143 yards and a touchdown in this game. We're going to see him do it right here again. He can do a little bit of everything. This is Jalen Tolbert. What he brings as an X receiver. He's got the ability to go up, deals with holding. Okay, that, that's just a little bit of everything right there. You're going to hear knocks on Jalen Tolbert like this isn't game changing speed, right? But he's got enough speed to get the edge on an SEC DB. He's got the strength and then obviously the hands like it's not always going to be a circus catch, but that's the type of stuff he can do. He can create his own separation when he's not 
getting it with his speed. That I just think that is such a good snapshot of all of the things that he can bring to the table. You could even see his eyes. They were locked in from the beginning because tracking the football is certainly something that has been a topic of conversation around his skill level. He played baseball all the way up until he was in high school, and then he switched to football full-time. Yeah. He uses that tracking ability not only on the edge of the gridiron, but he does it over the middle as well. So this, I, I love this just because I, we're going to see him in the slot here again. This is a guy that got used to doing everything. He doesn't even know that the play is about to start. Like you can see, they're in Knoxville. I'm sure it's loud at Neyland Stadium. Didn't even know the snap was coming. He's okay. He's got the reflexes. He's got the, the IQ to deal with it. And again, just dealing with solid coverage by Tennessee. Like again, he's not dusting these guys. He just knows how to get open, how to create his own separation. Love that he uses hand, his, both his hands to track the ball. And then again, I don't want to hear that this guy doesn't have any speed. Look, maybe it's not Alabama, but this is an SEC <laughs> team. He goes all the way to the house. That is a lot of yak. Again, seven catches for 143 yards against Tennessee. South Alabama lost that game 60 to 14. You would not know it based on how Jalen Tolbert played. He did it against the Sunbelt opponents as well. Against Arkansas State, he had 10 catches, 252 yards, and three touchdowns. The yards after the catch, the versatility, certainly things on the table, but so is pressure for Jalen Tolbert. Who else is under pressure for the Dallas Cowboys in 2022? We talk about it when we come back. Despite a 12 and 5 record and winning the NFC East in 2021, the pressure is on the Dallas Cowboys to go further into the playoffs and not be bounced out of the divisional round. Welcome back to Britt Johnson. I'm Kyle Yeomans as we bring you back into the Blitz here in the Globe Life Studios. Let's take a look at some of the highest pressure points for this Cowboys team coming up into 2022. I'm going to give you either or answers. Okay. So I give you two choices. You got to pick one of the two. Who has more pressure on them? This offseason, of course, going into the 2022 season. We'll start with Mike McCarthy or Dak Prescott, both of which that really have the weight of this season on their shoulders. November 13th, 2022, the Dallas Cowboys will play the Green Bay Packers. Mike McCarthy is going to be in his old stadium for the first time since he left. I think that game alone is the most pressure you need. He's a, won a Super Bowl with them, did not leave in a very good good manner. I think he's most pressure for that game for sure. Yeah, that week 10 matchup certainly going to ride on the shoulders of McCarthy. The national eyes will be on him. He's also got to find a way to find playoff success because that's mm -hmm. what this front office expects, especially with the roster that they've put together over the last couple of seasons. Now, Let's move to the defensive side of the football. Micah Parsons and Trayvon Diggs had great seasons a year ago. Who's under the most pressure to perform again this year in a repeat season? Okay, so I will mention something about Micah Parsons. Sophomore slump is a real thing. I do not think we're going to get that with Micah Parsons. I hope we don't get that with <laughs> Micah Parsons. I'm actually going to put this one on Trayvon Diggs just because after the 11 interceptions he had, record tying this last season, people still have questions about him. People still wonder, is he going to be one of those shutdown corners? And I think the pressure is going to be on him this season. Gave up more yards than any other mm -hmm. cornerback in the NFL last year. Yes, he had the interceptions, but it was a boom or bust mentality around Trayvon Diggs. Now let's go back to the offensive side. Ezekiel Elliott or Tony Pollard? It'll be a battle in the backfield. Pretty much a contract year for both. Tony Pollard, it is a contract year. Ezekiel Elliott still trying to prove he's an upper echelon back in this league. Well, to your point with Tony Pollard, I think it's just going to be a pressure thing for himself. I don't think there's a ton of pressure on him as far as everybody else is looking because, like they say, when much is given, much is required, and that is Ezekiel Elliott. He's the one that we're paying the top dollar. Um, Tony Pollard, we're only paying him a, roughly a million dollars for this season, so I don't think there's pressure on him from the fans or from the coaches or anything like that. I think the pressure is going to just be for himself if he wants to be that guy that's going to be paid in his next contract. The pressure this season is going to be on Ezekiel Elliott. I completely agree. Zeke, of course, having 1,000 yards for the first time in three seasons in 2021, but it took him up until the final game of the regular season to finally hit that 1K mark. When we come back, a deeper dive into the upcoming dates that were set by the Dallas Cowboys this offseason, including a date with the Broncos and the Chargers prior to the preseason. The Blitz was brought to you by AT&T, official sponsor of the Dallas Cowboys. 
and by the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. The Cowboys offseason continues to ramp up, but why not look ahead to some of the joint practices the Cowboys will have in their training camp. How about hosting the Denver Broncos on August 11th and then two separate joint practices with the Chargers on the 17th and 18th of the August month. And hey, good competition, good reps. It always helps your team moving forward. Of course, and it looks like we're getting Randy Gregory back for the Cowboys <laughs> training camp, apparently. He'll be right back in the uh, the comfortable confines mm -hmm. of Oxnard, California, and that'll be an interesting storyline back and forth. But before we leave you on the Blitz, we want to send our condolences to the family of Larry Lacewell. He was the former director of pro and college scouting for the Dallas Cowboys up until 2004. He passed away this week at the age of 85, and he will forever be in our hearts.